Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Patrick Cunningham and along with Judy Colby George, we will be your moderators. So as always, we're excited to be hosting our second uh, MEGUG virtual lunch and learn, brown bag lunch and learn. So it's uh, for 2021. This is called Glory Glory Paradoia, a method of addressing gerrymandering using topological rather than geometric means. I'm not going to explain that. I'm going to let our guest speaker do that. Uh, and today's featured speaker is Matt Duby. Um, he's an assistant professor of computer information systems and data science at the University of Maine at Augusta. Um, I'm one of the moderators, and as I said, Judy is our other moderator. But first, a word on the main GIS user group and our board, as you can see here is a diverse group of folks from across the state of Maine, GIS professionals, and um, our chair is Andy Smith-Peterson, and you can see the rest of the members here on my slide deck. The Maine GIS user group is a nonprofit organization, and we promote the awareness of and uh, encourage the coordinated development of effective use of geographic information and related technologies. MEGUG focuses our efforts in the areas of policy liaison and networking, research, education, and public relations. And the group facilitates discussion and exchange of information and ideas in these areas by hosting regular meetings, workshops, and roundtables open to both members and non-members. Uh, as everyone is probably aware now, we've pivoted to doing our meetings virtually and this has uh, become a lunch, a lunch and learn, a monthly lunch and learn series that we've been we've been doing now for almost a year. Um, but as things uh, hopefully improve over the course of the year, we're looking forward to hosting some in-person events. So please pay attention uh, on our website and our social media accounts for more information on that as things progress. Um, but we would love your involvement, even though we're doing things virtually, we could certainly use your involvement. Uh, the board is, we're going to be meeting next week uh, to go over our plans for the year. And we have a variety of committees that people can help with. And we also, of course, have these virtual uh, lunch and learn series. And we would love to hear from anyone who wanted to present uh, on uh, a GIS topic. Um, doesn't even have to be a topic where you feel like you uh, made a great finding or something super unique or whatever, we want to hear about how you do GIS. Um, we're not picky. Um, these are meant to be brown bag lunch and learns and just to create conversations and ed education. Uh, and sometimes uh, it's maybe something that you may not feel is that exciting, but others would find it interesting and helpful. So if you want to share, we would love to hear from you. All you have to do is send us an email at megugboard at gmail.com. As you can see, uh, we only have one uh, confirmed brown bag lunch and learn for next month, which is going to be on remote ID for drones and the challenges around that. Sam Knight will be presenting. But uh, beyond that, it's TBD. So please send us your ideas. Um, all of our lunch and learns, though, we are able to record them. So we've been posting them to our YouTube channel, which is kind of cool. So you can go and check out the past lunch and learns. Uh, maybe there's a topic you want to learn more about. Um, and that's all on our YouTube channel. And today's uh, event will also be posted there as long as everything works out technically. So I'm going to hand it over to Judy to present uh, our speaker today. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, we're all definitely looking forward to hearing from uh, Dr. Matt Duby. He's an assistant professor of computer information systems and data science at the University of Maine at Augusta. And he cooperates with the University of Maine Graduate School and the Environmental and Biological Science Division at the University of Maine at Machias. His research work focuses on applications of geographic principles to numerous situations, including congressional legislative redistricting, spatial query mechanisms, and community needs assessments. And we're very much looking forward to a very topical talk as uh, all of the states will be getting ready to redistrict over the next uh, couple of years. So um, we welcome Matt and I'm going to turn it back over to him. Sure. All right. So good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here and I want to thank Patrick and Judy for the uh, opportunity and the introdu introduction. 
I want to say that as a faculty member of the University of Maine system, uh, the views that are presented here are efforts of my academic research, not supported by any political party, and are the result of an academic assessment using the scientific method. I'd also like to acknowledge my colleagues who've helped with this work, notably Jesse Clark, who's soon to be Dr. Clark uh, from MIT uh, and a native of Calus, and soon to be postdoc at Princeton University and uh, Richard Powell, who's a professor of political science at the University of Maine. Uh, before I go any further, I just wanna say I'm not a political scientist. I am much more in tune with who members of the user group might be. I'm a GIS professional by trade. I'm a, a trained spatial informaticist. I come at political science from an interdisciplinary lens. So part geography, part math, and part data science. Uh, you could call me a spatial data scientist, which is a versioning breed within a versioning field. You may notice that I chose an interesting and perhaps unknown term as part of the title. Uh, so I use the term pareidolia. Uh, people may not have heard that term before. If you are in more of a uh, psych discipline, you may have heard of that. Uh, but let's, so we've heard this word employed in some way. If we haven't heard the word, we've certainly experienced it. So think about a bright and pleasant spring or summer day, wishful thinking, of course, as we're in the throes of winter here. Uh, when we look up at the clouds, we often will say things like, geez, that looks like an elliptical, or that looks like a pizza slice or something like that in the sky. That's the concept of pareidolia, namely assigning some sort of humanistic characteristic or some sort of object characteristic onto a random stimulus. Uh, and this is a fitting title for what we're going to talk about insofar that as we talk about a fractured political environment at best, the practice of redistricting leads to some very paradoxical shapes in the map. Uh, these shapes are not exactly random, according to many in the public. Uh, there's a substantial outcry about how congressional seats are already determined before anyone goes to the polls, yet the judicial branch of our government has not shown a propensity to intervene uh, under current arguments. And I bold that because that obviously changes as the composition of the court changes. The term pareidolia in this context is about whether or not we see identifiable shapes in the map. Uh, many congressional districts have been branded with funny names over the years. Uh, so there are districts that have been called the earmuffs of Chicago, for instance, goofy kicking Donald Duck uh, in Pennsylvania. Uh, there's a rabbit on a skateboard in uh, Western Illinois. Uh, these sorts of things come to mind. But the question is, why do we get shapes like that at all? Uh, and the part of this is uh, this term gerrymander that we hear. And that's a portmanteau. It begins with one word and ends with another. Uh, we're probably somewhat familiar with that term, but I personally hate it. Uh, people refer to the process of redistricting by this term, uh, which should tell you something. Uh, the general public tends to acknowledge that there are significant problems in the political map about where the lines are drawn. But the question is, can anyone actually define it? And technically, a gerrymander is any redistricting attempt that prioritizes an ideology or a goal. Uh, we tend to think of that as protecting a party, protecting an incumbent, protecting some sort of interest group, typically negative things. But on the other hand, it could promote competitiveness in elections and it can be seen in that sense as a, an effort of gerrymandering. In essence, we can think about gerrymandering in a more mathematical, a mathematical way, something that's not randomly drawn using established rules of a line drawing process. So if we're doing something that is beyond what would happen randomly within following specific rules that are established by a state, we might call that a gerrymander. The word gerrymander comes from the name of a former governor of Massachusetts, and actually gerrymander is the wrong way to say it. It'd actually be gerrymander, as Elbridge Gerry uh, was the governor of Massachusetts, uh, who proposed and passed a redistricting plan that provided support for his political party, the Democratic Republicans. In essence, what he did was to select specific communities to advantage candidates in his state legislature from his own party. They took a sweeping win in that election, in large part because of the effort. So the mander part of that portmanteau uh, comes from the pareidolic concept. It looks like a salamander. Uh, which I don't get that by looking at this political cartoon, 
Uh, this depiction comes from a political cartoon in, in the time that this district was created, and thus the term gerrymander was born. So why are we talking about this right now? Well, it's quite simple. Gerrymandering still happens, but it's also incredibly relevant to right now. The US Census is conducted every decade, we just finished this, uh, to determine in essence where people live. So in the past, and certainly the present, the role of the census has certainly been to help allocate federal resources, such as things like tax dollars, but more importantly, in a representative democracy, its largest impact is most certainly in the political power. To create equally populated congressional districts and legislative districts at the state level, it's necessary to know where people live. Where those people live and how that changes triggers the process of reapportionment in the United States, which would assign new numbers of seats to each state. Uh, certain states will gain representation while other states will lose it. Most states actually say the same. If the state has a change in seats, then it must redistrict. However, each state usually will redistrict every 10 years uh, because the populations move, as we all know in the geographic world. So this is some evidence of this. So we haven't finished the 2020 census yet in terms of looking at the, uh, the final numbers of this. But if you were to take population projections for 2020, and play them out as to how many congressional districts each state should have, you'll see that certain states that are in green here would be advantaged by their population. So certain states would pick up seats, while certain states here that are in pink would lose seats to some extent. What I've done on the right-hand side of the slide is I have consolidated states that we might call red states, which are consistently won by Republicans, blue states, which are consistently won by Democrats, and by consistently, I mean in the last four elections, uh, and then purple states, which are states that have been won by either party in the last four election cycles. So if you play these numbers out, just on that level, uh, red states would appear to gain seats on the level of four, uh, blue states would, would gain two seats, then red states would lose two seats in some states, so they're plus two. Uh, blue states would lose five, so they're now minus three. And then the purple states are plus one. So when you look at this, this leads us to consider that the Republican Party actually might be benefited by the movement of the population. Now, that doesn't mean that the Republican Party necessarily is going to win control of the House. It doesn't mean that the Republican Party will hold the presidency. What it means is that the movement of the map, if you go by current trends that have occurred, would lead to uh, this idea that the map right now favors the Republican Party just on the level of who lives in what state when you look at the total presidential vote, but this is not the whole story. So to address whether or not a certain party would have an advantage, uh, we have to think about what the rules of the system are to take those numbers and actually play them out into the seats in the states. Uh, the rules in the system are a confluence of federal standards as well as state level standards. So at the federal level, there's very few things that are required of congressional districts. It's required that they are connected so long as they can be. So if you look at Maine, if you look at MDI, uh, MDI needs to be in the closest district that it could connect to. So it's not really a problem in Maine, but in other states that might be a big problem. Um, something else, they have to have relatively equal population uh, depending on how you define that. It's usually percentage wise, uh, somewhere around 3%. And they have to institute some form of minority protection due to the Voting Rights Act. Now, that's been in flux in recent years because the Supreme Court uh, made a decision called about Shelby versus Holder, which eliminated a term you may have heard, which is preclearance, uh, where if a state that had a history of minority disenfranchisement tried to change anything about their voting process, the uh, Federal Department of Justice would have to approve that before it could go into law. Uh, 
Uh, so some states require additional concepts that are much more spatially charged. And this is where the GIS can come into this. Uh, sometimes we have to respect established boundaries that exist at various levels. So counties, towns, school districts, legislative districts, things like that. Uh, making districts shaped in compact ways, which is a geometric term, or preserving communities of interest. So where certain groups of people live. Uh, the way those rules play out influence where the lines are drawn and what ultimately could be realized. So a deeper question, one which we're going to tackle today, is whether or not these things are A, implemented by the states faithfully, and B, what is the impact of those rules? And this is an enormous problem in the United States. So congressional districts and legislative districts shape policies and elections for a decade and perhaps more. The reason for that is that in many of the states, the congressional and legislative districts are drawn by who happens to be in power. You may think that might not have a large effect, but I would say that you'd be wrong. Uh, so to demonstrate my claim, the state of North Carolina over the last 145 years has spent 20 years under a Republican governor. So one in every seven years or thereabouts. As such, its redistricting plan, you could probably guess, has been slanted toward the Democratic Party at worst and would be balanced at best. Until 2010, the redistricting process in that state had been controlled by the Democratic Party ever since Reconstruction. Uh, so in 2010, a massive counter movement to the Affordable Care Act and the presidency of Barack Obama led to a Republican victory in, in 2010. For the first time since Reconstruction, Republicans were able to redistrict that state. In, in 2010, North Carolina sent seven Democrats to the U.S. House. That's the last uh, cycle under the 2000 census. In 2012, North Carolina would send 10 Republicans under a new map. So to put this in context, North Carolina has 13 congressional districts. So it went from 7-6 to 10-3 in the other direction. That's a substantial shift. Uh, North Carolina's evidence of an adage that politicians pick their voters, not the other way around. Uh, there were instances in 2010 where sitting representatives were drawn into new districts in order to remove them from office. Uh, so there was a TV special done about that. Uh, the map in North Carolina, however, met backlash. It got contested and thrown out by the courts, but it already influenced four elections before it was removed. So this was a situation where representative democracy was destroyed. A 50-50 state such as North Carolina should never send over three quarter of its congressional delegation for a single party. It doesn't make any ethical sense. This is only one problem though. The other problem is competitiveness. So if you had to guess what proportion of seats in the United States, when you look at the presidential vote, are one with a two party voter share of less than 60%. So anything between um, 40 and 60% or 50 and 60% is the winning percentage. And if you come to a sort of conclusion to that in your head, the answer is 20%. So one out of every five districts is within a 20% swing between the two districts or between the two parties. So why does that matter? If you look in Congress right now, these are the people who are incentivized to compromise with other politicians. So you've heard of that during the impeachment trials of the current president, or the past, sorry, the past president. Uh, certain politicians deviated from party lines in the vote or had to seriously consider it due to the district they came from. Incidentally, the fact that they considered the party at all is actually wrong, but it's a symptom of the problem that is redistricting. So what we've seen generally is that the attitude to policing redistricting is the know it when you see it doctrine. Uh, so to quote uh, a sports journalist, if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it ain't no damn mongoose. That, however, is an unacceptable standard. People can see things in vastly different ways. As such, there are different procedures which are used to try to explain congressional districts and their faithfulness. Uh, one class of measures is about voting statistics, things like declination, mean, median, and efficiency gap. We'll see these in a second. Uh, these have become part of the modern vernacular due to a recent court case, uh, Gill versus Whitford, which challenged the redistricting plan of the state of Wisconsin. Uh, these measures look at differences in how partisan districts are based on their party. Uh, 
uh, geometrical compactness measures focus on the shape of districts. How convex are they? So this gets back to high school geometry. How convex are they? How circular are they? How efficiently do the perimeters bound the areas? Uh, these have been the gold standard for a long time and are the ultimate manifestation of you know it when you see it. Topological compactness measures reflect networks, and this is where my work comes from. Uh, these are defined by graph theory, much more like a road network. Uh, we're going to talk about that as we progress. Uh, but ultimately, the moves in political science right now are trending toward counterfactual sampling, which essentially you create samples that could have been possible uh, by the methods that are in place, and then you compare what is to what could have been. Uh, and that's really interesting in that when we think of congressional districts today, we don't necessarily think of what could have been, we look at what is. So as I said, North Carolina is the ultimate case of the know it when you see it. On the top is the redistricting plan that came out of North Carolina in uh, after the 2010 census. Uh, if you were to, uh, let me pull this up real quick. If you were to look right here, and then this uh, green one and the orange one and the light green one that are right beside it, things look quite fishy, right? This doesn't look like a, you, this doesn't look like a very ethically based map. What's actually happening there is that it's consolidating significant swaths of an African-American population. So it turned out that of course, when you redistrict something like that, that when you have uh, a large minority population, you expect there's going to be a large Democratic voter turnout, which is, of course, the case in those districts. Uh, so that's how the Republican Party got advantage in this state was by consolidating uh, those votes. So North Carolina's uh, district was actually challenged and it was thrown out uh, because uh, the, the map was thrown out because not because of the partisan issue but because of the profiling issue of a group of the population. So what you see on the bottom is the proposed remedy, which is much, much more in line with the population of the state, much cleaner borders in most cases, but it didn't go into effect until the last election that we just had a few months ago. So this redistricting plan survived for four cycles and damaged certain voters in that state because this occurred. So you may think that this is not an issue for the presidency. It actually is. So in the Democratic primary, uh, this is not true in the Republican primary, in the Republican primary, it's winner take all. In the Democratic primary, 40% of the votes are given to whoever wins the states, the statewide vote, but 60% of the delegates in the Democratic primary are assigned based on the congressional district itself. So each party can actually influence the Democratic primary, which is kind of interesting. Uh, people don't usually think about how the Republican Party could actually influence the Democratic primary. In states that are controlled processes by the Republican Party, they actually do have a, an impact on the Democratic primary. So there are three types of geometric measures. Uh, dispersion measures look at how spread out something is. Uh, these measures focus on how convex an object is, how circular it is, how square it is. Uh, in this case, it would be hip to be square. Um, indentation has to do with perimeter. Uh, so in essence, how does the indentation uh, reflect corresponding circles with those parameters? So if you have a perimeter in an area, what's the size of the circle that has the same perimeter, how does that area relate to the uh, area of the district and vice versa. Um, the other measure that has to do with indentation is about internal boundary lines. These are lines that the redistrictors have control over. Uh, redistrictors do not have control over state boundaries, of course. So, so a state like Maine actually has a has higher uh, or lower compactness scores than it should because of the coastline of Maine. Uh, so that's something that we need to work through. Um, symmetry measures look at the district in a mirror. So is a district compa comparable with its mirror image over its axes? That's a different way of thinking about shape 
is do we have something that uh, looks like it could be uh, flipped over? So this is an example of a dispersion measure. So what we have is a convex hull on the right. So we are taking. So this is an operation you'd see in a GIS. Uh, on the left, we have the REOC measure, which is comparing perimeter to perimeter. Uh, so that REOC uh, measure is trying to create a circle that uh, circumscribes the object, uh, and then you compare perimeters. Uh, so as you can see, that district that's in Georgia is uh, quite. Uh, quite different than it maybe should be in the convex hall one is the uh, earmuffs of Chicago. Indentation uh, will lead these measures to fall out of whack. So what we did here on the Palsby Popper measure is to take the perimeter of the district, turn that into a circle, and then look at the area of the district compared to the area of that circle. Uh, and Schwartzberg takes the area of the district, makes that the area of the circle, and then compares perimeter to perimeter. So what we have here is a ranking of all of the congressional districts in the United States in the last cycle based on the Palsby Popper measure. As you can see, a lot of the most fishy districts appear on the surface to be Democratic districts. Uh, that does not mean that they were drawn by Democrats. Uh, they likely were drawn in many cases by Republicans or they were drawn to try to group a minority. Why is that? This helps control representation. It's advantageous for, and this is not meant to be a partisan statement, this is objective, it's advantageous for the Republican Party to pile Democrats into a district and vice versa. Uh, minority voters have a protective clause in federal statute, which actually can lead to some of this. Uh, some of these districts are influenced by coastlines and meandering rivers. So for example, Maine's first district, which is uh, the circle right there is in the upper third of uh, compactness scores or non-compactness scores in this case, while Maine's second district, which is down here, is in the lower third. Uh, so Maine's coastline has a lot to do with that uh, because it unduly influences the perimeter of the object. But the question that I have to pose, and I think it's important, is, is shape the greatest indicator of an election? So we may have seen this picture before on social media. The answer is unequivocally no. This is a popular representation that's been shown uh, for both sides of the political aisle. Uh, it essentially converts one into the other. So a conservative might show you this picture that starts in the front, where you have a huge red map. And then someone who's more liberal might show you, well, hey, land doesn't vote, people vote, okay? So this is sort of this dueling perspective of what's happening. So this is essentially a cartogram feature. But the point is geometry doesn't capture people directly. Uh, geometry doesn't capture the human elements and effects of redistricting, though it's hypothesized to be a reasonable surrogate. Uh, states that require compactness essentially are asserting that geometry uh, rules that day. But as a mathematician, I can see why you would do that. But as a geographer, however, there's something very much missing in that approach, which is how can we make more appropriate geographic approaches to understanding this issue? The answer, I believe, rests in two areas. The first is in statistical approaches. Statistical approaches represent how the lines on the map partition voters into districts by looking at various measurements about the support of the various parties. So this is looking at who lives there, okay? So each one would look at it in a different way. So declination looks at the difference in angle from a Republican district to a Democrat district. Uh, so what we have here is a, an angle that's being formed. Uh, the blue dots are the proportion of Democratic votes in a district. The blue dots down here are proportions of Republican votes, or uh, pro sorry, proportion of Democrat votes in a Republican district. So they lost versus they won. Uh, in a perfect world, that line FGH would be straight, uh, but it's not. So the difference in the angle is what we refer to as declination. Mean median is a measure of how the mean vote total in a state's congressional districts for a party relates to the median of that same measure. Essentially, it's a measure of packing and cracking. 
So if I overly consolidate voters in one group, the average is going to go up, but the median is going to stay the same. As such, the difference gets higher. If we go the other way, it can uh, become more muted. So we're looking for more balanced districts when we look at this type of approach. The efficiency gap is about wasted votes. Uh, wasted votes are those votes that exceed the number to win their congressional district. So anything beyond one vote more than your opponent is a wasted vote. And any vote cast for a losing candidate is a wasted vote by efficiency gap. So the goal of a party when they are trying to create districts is to lose big and win small. Uh, so if you do that enough, you win control of delegations, even if you don't control the state in terms of its population. As such, political parties are incentivized to make competitive districts that they will win and non-competitive districts that they will lose. The second way to think about geography, I would argue, is a topological approach which uh, bases itself on connection. So rather than thinking about it from a geometric point of view, why not think about it from a graphic point of view? A recent set of work, including our own, focuses on developing counterfactual districts by reducing the amount of edges dissolved to partition the map. Uh, so these are the types of skills that I learned in graduate school. I use these concepts and still do to develop work in machine learning, uh, where you might assess pixel spaces for spatial prepositions. You might take partitions in a map and say, hey, do these partitions surround this other one? Uh, so the types of things we're talking about are your polygon neighbor tool in an ArcGIS, your uh, topological query mechanisms, those sorts of things. Uh, that's the sort of work I do outside of this area. So the premise of this approach is rooted solely in geography. The first law of geography, as we all know, is that everything is related, but near things are more related than distant things. Uh, this is a simplistic way of trying to encapsulate the concept of the community of interest which happens to be this amorphous term that's used to justify redistricting plans. It's amorphous because nobody can define it. In essence, our approach boils down to separating fewer communities that neighbor each other into separate districts, which is near and dear to my heart because I live in a town that's on the border of its congressional district. So that directly influences me. So the question is, does that approach hold water? So to think about whether or not that makes sense as a community of interest gauge, uh, what I did was to use the polygon neighbor tool and say, all right, what are the statistics for one parcel of land and how does that compare to all of its neighbors lumped up as one group? So as I make a larger and larger circle around a circle, quote unquote, around an area, does the population tend to mirror itself on the larger level? with the smaller level aggregate. So what we did was we looked at uh, white and black. We looked at those who earned 100K plus for earning families. And then we looked at uh, the number of advanced degrees earned or the percentage of advanced degrees earned. And the short answer is yes. So what you're gonna see here is a sequence of figures and you're gonna see a steep correlation between the proportion existing in the precinct and the proportion existing in the neighboring precinct. So these are uh, white uh, people in a district or in a, in a precinct versus its neighbors. These are black people, which this is largely inverse of each other uh, because these are the two largest groups of the population for the most part. Uh, that's not necessarily true now, this is changing, uh, but the point is the correlation is steep in all cases. So these are people who, these are families that earn over 100K. And then, and this is nationwide, by the way. And this is also the advanced degree population. So you can see pretty clearly that the proportion of one of these things very much dictates the proportion in the other. So this would suggest that people live near people who are like them. It's not a surprise, uh, but that does have interest to us politically. So on a side, I've worked with other people about things similar to this. I recently have been involved with Kristen Gleason down at USM uh, looking at uh, poverty and how that impacts rural areas in the state. Uh, we're trying to detect where there would be homeless populations around Maine. Uh, that are not in cities, uh, which is uh, interesting because it's not easily countable. Uh, so we're looking to see if you could uh, 
figure out areas that have a high uh, set of bad economic indicators that would lead to that. So I've done a lot of presentations with educational agencies about the impacts of poverty on children at that level as well through uh, GIS. It's also flexible. Uh, many of the rules that are asked for in the redistricting process are motivated by connection, not by their geometry. Because of that, we're able to apply rules for the various states to help randomly divide the map based on removing edges, which is how our algorithm works, is that we are trying to dissolve as few edges as possible, uh, so as few neighboring communities uh, ending up in opposite districts. So this is a visual of the algorithm. You start with a map in the top left. Uh, you break it into a certain number of groups. You then break it down into fewer groups that are based on that initial subdivision, turn them back over into their network, and then try to balance their population iteratively. Uh, so at each step along the path, there are swaps that are tried or that we try to make uh, to make the edge uh, distribution more efficient. And then we reinflate the map to balance the populations. So we make advances by doing things on a smaller level and then passing those changes up, which should lead to holding things as stable as possible. Uh, so to give you an idea of how quickly this works, uh, this uh, can process the state of California, which is the largest state in the country, both in number of partitions to create and number of precincts. Uh, it takes about four seconds to draw a map of California doing this. Uh, and that's using only a single thread. If you multi-thread that, it will go much, much faster. In Maine, you snap your fingers, it's done. Uh, so you could conceivably in California generate thousands of, you could generate over a thousand samples in an hour for the California Redistricting Commission to work with, to be able to choose a map to deal with California. A bigger challenge though, is how do you predict the vote? Uh, so precinct returns though, they're typically available, are notoriously hard to come by in a form where you can connect them to a map. So our research is hoping to change that by showing the value of spatial data about elections. But in the meantime, we've worked our way around that by taking known precinct returns from 2008, because everybody wanted to know how Obama won, because it was a landmark election, and compared that to the county returns using the proportion of people who lived in a town that voted either Democrat or Republican, as a share of the Democratic or Republican vote in their county. So assuming that that's stable, we then are able to pass that percentage along across into other elections. Now, I wouldn't necessarily do that in this past year because it seems like it's a radically different uh, situation. But in 2008, going into 2012, and even going into 2016, the procedure got 431 of the 435 congressional districts in the United States correct. And the four that it missed, they were coin flip districts in the real world. So in other words, it's pretty effective and it's uh, very efficient to be able to deal with it that way. So essentially this is a graphical view of the equation. You take the actual election return divided by the county return, multiply it by the county return in the new year. And essentially you derive the election uh, return for the next uh, cycle. So using our simulations in these votes, we are able to look at the voting oriented redistricting measures uh, that are there. So efficiency gap, mean, median, and declination. Uh, our measures are positively correlated with the efficiency gap, mean, median, and declination measures used to argue recent litigation. Uh, so these are pictures of the declination set. So these are all, these dots are all states. We have the seat differential, which is taking the number of seats in the real world and uh, comparing that to the number of seats we projected it to have over a thousand samples for each state. Uh, and we compared that to the declination measure. As the seat differential goes uh, up, the uh, declination measure goes up. And as it gets more negative, it gets more negative as well, which both are problems. Uh, seat differential to mean median, same idea. And the seat differential to the efficiency gap is a very, very strong correlation, as you can see here. We correlated our measures, which are the uh, internal boundary growth, excess edge, edge cut growth, and edge per district gain, 
We took every measure that is used so far to evaluate congressional districts and try to uh, correlate them uh, to those to each other. Uh, so we saw a substantial correlation between our measures and the other uh, geometric measures, but topological measures are faster uh, to use. Uh, you might think it's important to think about correlation, but I would argue that's actually important to talk about when they don't agree because one of the things that's interesting is that a, a, a district could have a high schwartzberg score but a low convex hull score for instance those are really interesting because if you choose the measure you can actually have a uh, a view that's not necessarily consistent with another one uh, which could lead to cases for increased scrutiny because if you choose one measure you could actually hide an issue uh, that exists in the map. So another thing that we looked at was competitiveness. Uh, so when considering the competitiveness of our, of our proposed redistricting plans, remember that 20% figure that we threw out there? We doubled that. We were able to produce 40% of congressional districts in the United States on average that would be competitive. That's double. Imagine what that would mean for Congress if 40% of people had to be willing to compromise to stay in office. And just imagine how that would change the dynamics of what we see on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, our simulations produced uh, an angular offset of about 11 degrees, that's a physics measurement. Uh, so we looked at how minority populations were distributed across the districts. Our districts produced a significant change in the racial diversity nationally albeit in a very interesting way, uh, rather than increasing the majority or minority districts themselves, we saw a larger amount of significant minority blocks. And we're looking to do more research into that area. Uh, and part of that is that what defines reasonable control of a congressional district? Is it a majority of your party comes from that uh, group? because this is typically going to be a Democratic voter share? Is it a majority of the Democratic primary voters or is it a majority of the whole district that would fulfill the VRA? That's something that is an interesting question because it's not very well defined. Uh, in terms of compactness, which I think is one of the most fascinating parts of our research, our algorithm's not designed to create geometric compactness. However, it beats algorithms that are designed exactly to do that. Uh, and it's much faster. Uh, so I just thought that was interesting that connection topologically served as a surrogate for geometric compactness. It beat the measures at their own game. So the punchline is simple. Republicans winning in 2010 in the uh, general elections uh, during the midterm uh, gave them a boon in the political map. That boon under our simulations is on the order of 16 seats. So this is about... Uh, there's a little less than 5% of Congress. Uh, that's, a, uh, that's a significant number. And we just published that last year in the Election Law Journal. And I will say that this is scathing to the practices of 2020, or not 2020, 2010, but it's not inherently a Republican thing. It's a partisan thing. The same happens when, with Democrats when they would control a red state. Uh, this often happens during midterm elections that coincide with the census. So you could imagine if what happened in Georgia uh, if that were for control of their state house and not the Senate, uh, that could lead to Georgia having a democratically slanted map. Uh, I don't think that's going to be the case because their state house is still largely Republican, but at the same time, that's the situation you'd be looking at. It's why voting in 2020 was so important because it's a, it's a census year which triggers this process. It shapes a decade of representation at all levels, including presidents and the judiciary branch. It influences the president because of the Democratic primary. It doesn't matter who necessarily you support in my eyes, but getting out there and making your voice heard is important. Even if you think your candidate's not gonna win, you should still go and vote. Uh, people have fought for that right to do that, and conversely, to not do that, both civilian and military. Um, the future of what we're doing uh, so we want to look at just how different the maps are. So right now I have an undergraduate student who is working on trying to figure out how different our simulation spaces are. Uh, 
Uh, so how our districts compare to one another, uh, but also how they compare to the real world, because one of the things we have to worry about in trying to drive change in redistricting is trying to keep districts semi-intact as they exist in the world. So there's huge debate about that uh, in terms of the political science community, because um, realistically, the assumptions in the past have been that those that are already drawn have passed, therefore they're legal, therefore we need to start from that. I don't think that's the case necessarily because what you're talking about is a group of things that were passed without scrutiny. So those are things we need to address. Uh, we're in an effort with MIT and Tufts to try to produce a national precinct map. It's a very realistic goal if you're able to uh, join data up quickly. Having that type of data available quickly allows for fundamentally more rigorous voting analysis and it doesn't have to get into, well, we assume it's gonna vote this way, we don't know that. Uh, such a product would revolutionize the way in which you generate counterfactual districts. Uh, as for now, we have to rely on predictions of the votes, uh, but if you can use precinct uh, votes to maps, this gives you way more reliable numbers. A more synergistic approach is that we need to think about uh, all the measures in concert. Can't just use one, uh, just using one prioritizes a certain feature, uh, but there are several different ways a district could be screwed up. Uh, so I would argue for more of a orchestra approach to trying to evaluate districts, uh, at least one from a geometric measure, at least one from a connectivity measure of some sort, and at least one about voting measurements for sure, uh, because there's lots of different things that are involved in that. Um, this is a PCA, principal components analysis, just to show you different orientations of how things play out. So this is showing you that the space is not as simple as you might think. Uh, what we were also working on right now is trying to figure out cases where our measures identify things that look weird compared to other measures. So what we did was to break this into groups of uh, thirds uh, with each measure, and those that occur in the lower, uh, the lower three groups, so the middle bottom, the right bottom, and the, the right center, uh, those three groups are things that are less, uh, that are more on our measure than they would be correspondingly in the world. Uh, so those are places we want to take a bigger look at, including a couple states that were interesting in the most past election, Michigan and Arizona. Uh, Idaho is a traditionally Republican state. Louisiana has a traditional Republican uh, state uh, alignment, but at the same time has a very sizable minority population. So this is a place where it might be interesting to think about the impacts of something like this. Uh, we are one of the only simulation procedures that tries to implement the VRA. Uh, and it's really hard to do because the standard's a floating one. So by using demographic data, we have the tools to do it, but we're also currently working on what actually encapsulates the rule. So is it overall minorities? Is it a control of the minority block and conversely, control of the Democratic primary, something like that. Uh, so that's something that we're currently working on how that works out. What did you say? What did yeah, you say, ahead. Matt, what did you say VRA stood for? Voting Rights Act. Okay. So, so passed that, in 1965. Go ahead. So that is the, obviously the federal voting That's rights. at the federal level, passes down to every state. So that's what I was gonna, I want, I had a, we had a question earlier that I wanted to, I didn't see the, a good place to interrupt you. And I yeah, I've got like two slides left. We can cover it in the end if you want to. Well, I mean, I think the question that the is what it you know is it so the law comes that's a federal law, and mm -hmm. is that the law that the states are all supposed to follow, or right. are states okay. able? Okay, to... Okay, I'll give you uh, some clarity on that. So the yeah. Voting Rights Act was passed in 1965. So People may have heard the Voting Rights Act come up a lot in the last year because John Lewis passed away. John mm -hmm. Lewis was the guy who led the march over the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama, for mm -hmm. those who are familiar. Uh, so the Voting Rights Act was passed because of the, so the 14th Amendment, let's wind a clock back. The 14th Amendment to the US Constitution uh, 
ensures that uh, African Americans are citizens of the United States. Anybody born on U.S. soil is a citizen of the United States. That's how uh, that's how uh, the former slaves were uh, granted citizenship. Uh, the 15th Amendment guarantees African Americans the right to vote. Uh, but what the states did with that was that they enacted policies that they would employ differentially. So for instance, you may have heard of poll taxes, uh, where you would somebody who wanted to vote had to pay a tax to vote. So imagine if you're poor, which mm -hmm. most people who had endured slavery would be poor. Uh, so it wasn't about race that was causing the states to not allow um, African Americans to vote. It was because they didn't have enough money to vote. Uh, right. The same is true with uh, literacy tests. So people may have heard of the uh, Louisiana did something where they would administer a literacy test that is just meant to be mental gymnastics, uh, and they would only apply it to African American voters or they would administer civics tests. And if an African-American voter got the question right, they would ask him another question, which was on a more finer grain scale. So in the Selma movie that came out recently, you saw an example of someone who was asked to name all of the court justices in the state of Alabama. I don't know right. of a single person who could do that in Maine. Right, right. so I mean, what, what, I was, what I think is interesting is, you know, we're all, we're, we're all geospatial professionals. Um, many of our listeners are scientists and spatial scientists, mm -hmm. and, and we can uh, follow along an argument like the geometric argument of what the stats are showing as far as are these good geometries to be using for laying out districts. We can follow that along, but I think that when I look at that map of Maine, what you know, I, what jumped out at me was, oh yeah, that southern area of Maine is where all the population is, where all the taxes are paid, uh, and then the rest of the state is, is rural. And, and I think that a lot of people break these down to very concrete, quick things because, so the opposite side of this conversation would be, um, well, why should we redistrict based on some complicated science, right? I mm -hmm. wanna be represented. I want this to make sense. So I, yep. I guess what I'm wondering is what is the argument that will resonate to help improve this and, and stop gerrymandering. You know, competitiveness in an election makes sense. Is there mm -hmm. something that you guys point to that will, will resonate with the larger population as well as the laws that we would need to? So I think number one, for me, number one is competitiveness uh, in that you get more movement in policy when people have to respond to their entire constituency. I think that's obviously number one. Uh, number two, in my eyes goes back to the geographic argument generally, which is I should vote with my neighbors, right? I live near people who are similar to me. Therefore, the fewer communities that I break up, and I've actually had this experience, I'm glad you asked this. I had this experience talking to political scientists as a computer scientist. And uh, the way I phrased that, they all asked me to dinner. And the reason was that they said I should be the one on the stand when these go to court because the point was it wasn't some sort of grandiose theory it was literally my neighbors i shouldn't be separated from them when i vote mm -hmm. so i live in oakland why in the world should i be separated from waterville economically we're not but we are definitely so waterville's in district one for those who don't know and oakland's in district two right. uh so Realistically, why in the world should I be voting in any district that doesn't include Waterville? It doesn't make sense. So, so competitiveness, when, voting with your neighbors, are there any other? Those, those are the two big ones to yeah. me. It's like, those are the simplest, obvious things. But then we, and this is why I went back to the 15th Amendment. So the 15th Amendment had ways to be circumvented. So the Voting Rights Act was put in place to make sure that the 15th Amendment couldn't be circumvented by the states. So the 15th Amendment, for those who have done and kept track, the 15th Amendment says that the states cannot deny the vote based on race. Doesn't say that they have to grant the right to vote. Okay, the wording is critical. Mm -hmm. So the Voting Rights Act forces the states essentially to not be able to restrict 
voting in any way that can be tied back to racial demographics. And that's one of the things that the Southern states made a mockery of traditionally, which is why this is something that's part of redistricting today. So, so in 2013, so I'm going to, um, I'm gonna, if you want to sort of finish up your next few slides, then we can maybe get in a couple of quick questions, just reminding you that we're coming to the end of the hour. Yep. I mean, this is really sure. interesting stuff. I don't mean to cut you off. I apologize. No, that's fine. So if we use the edge approach, we can uh, understand a little bit about voting. So when I teach programming students, I make them do an exercise like this, where they have to look at what are the layers of a congressional district. So what's on the outside of it, what's in the next layer in, almost like a layer cake. Uh, so what's interesting is if you consolidate the outer layers of districts and the inner layers of districts, so the outer 50 and the inner 50, that's what I've done in this graphic is you have blue uh, uh, dots here that were won by Democrats, reddish dots were won by Republicans. Uh, depending on the coloration of the dots, they were drawn by a different type of commission. Uh, so what's interesting to me are the districts that are in the top left quadrant and the districts in the bottom right quadrant, which there are very few of them. These are ones where the outer half does not align with the inner half in terms of who lives there. Uh, so what's interesting to me is that, and the other one that's interesting to me is where are the purplish dots? So where are the magenta dots and where are the purple dots? Because these were dots drawn by the opposite party. Uh, so really unpacking this picture is a key thing when you look at redistricting because it gives you some insights of how they were actually drawn. Um, and that we don't have time to really do that, but this is something that can be a really interesting uh, opportunity for people. Uh, this looks at districts as you slice them up uh, layer by layer. These are uh, Democrat drawn districts that Republicans won. Uh, so they tend to be rel relatively consistent across the line. Uh, but when you look at Republican drawn Democratic won districts, they tend to get more intense as you get to the middle of them. So the left side is the outside of the district, the right side is progressively further in, and you can see that those lines tend to get more and more democratic, uh, which is sort of evidence of like this packing procedure. Uh, but they, these are complicated to kind of get into, but I just wanted people to see it. Uh, so I wanna uh, thank everybody for their attention. I think it's an important discussion that we have these days because a lot of people and I, I taught a class like this for students. One of the things to uh, recognize is that very few people know enough about how their government is constructed. Uh, we've seen an erosion in civics education in the United States uh, for various reasons, uh, to the point of I could ask you how redistricting occurs and very few of you likely could tell me how that occurs. And it's one of the bedrock principles that underlies our government. Uh, so I think it's important to really focus on that right now uh, because it has a huge impact on the next 10 years in this country. Uh, so I will uh, stop it with that. Uh, so I'll uh, see. How yeah, that's, uh, thank you, Matt. I mean, I, I'm, again, folks, if you have questions, please throw them right in the chat panel. Um, we, would, uh, we would like to, uh, to take a moment to answer your questions um, while we're waiting for those. Um, and I'll come back to what we were talking about before, Patrick, if you don't mind. Uh, so yeah, I mean, in 2013, I, yeah, go yeah, ahead. I didn't have one question. In, mm -hmm. Yeah. In 2013, there was a court case, Shelby versus Holder, which challenged the uh, preclearance statute of the VRA. Uh, so if a state had a history of voter suppression, essentially, uh, they were uh, prohibited from making changes to their voting system without clearance from the federal government. Uh, so in 2013, a county in Alabama challenged that. Uh, so Holder is the uh, Holder is the Secretary of State of Alabama. Uh, Shelby County is the Shelby and Shelby versus Holder. Uh, the Supreme Court held that uh, the the data used to enforce that law. Uh, was outdated, therefore the application of the law could not stand. So it, after that happened, uh, you saw a huge string of states come out that would have been preclearance states, so like your Alabama, your Georgia, states like this, uh, 
uh, came out with voter ID laws uh, that were in some ways connectable to, um, to being able to suppress the vote. So the voter ID laws on their face, nothing really wrong with them, but at the same time, we, alongside that, they were closing places with which to get the ID. So it's not a coincidence that they were passed directly after Shelby versus Holden. Uh, so the Voting Rights Act is essentially the, the legislative remedy to states circumventing the 15th Amendment, which is why that's part of redistricting at this point. So I just wanted to double back to that to clarify. No, that's good stuff. Um, so we do have a few questions. Uh, I'm going to uh, just throw out, I'm not asking this question, Matt, but your last point about how people don't really know how we just uh, know, know that much about our government and how things change and redistrict, redistricting. I'm not going to mention the word electoral college. Um, yeah. so that's just my little joke there, but I will go to the question. So uh, one, uh, we have a question from Claire. How do you think the Supreme Court would react to an argument based on topological methods? That's an interesting question. So if it were presented as topological methods, I think they would shoot it down a heartbeat. If it were presented as the spirit of this is keep people with their neighbors, it's got a shot, I would think. The, so what the Supreme Court has said in Gill versus Whitford is we will not use something that doesn't pass the common sense test, essentially. So the question is, does the geographic principle of near things are more relatable past the common sense test. I would argue yes, but I am not a constitutional lawyer. So I have to couch that there, but I would think it would, but at the same time, I don't know. But I think that's a great question, Claire. So uh, Matt, we have a, another question that is asking about representation um, in thinking about competitive competitiveness, uh, is there a higher level of percentages? So for instance, if a state is split 60-40 overall, do you look mm -hmm. to make the districts be split 60-40? Or you know, does everything aim for 50-50? Or how do yeah, you- Yeah, that's, that's a good question. So there are different philosophies, right? So one is to mirror your state. If you mirror your state district by district, you're going to have a uniform delegation, right? So if you if you have a state that's 60-40 and you try to make every district 60-40, you're going to have everybody from the same party represent that state, which doesn't really pass the sniff test, right? <laughs> so another uh, way that people do that is to make the delegation represent the state, right? So if I'm a 60-40 state and I've got 10 seats, I should have six of that party and four of the other, right? Uh, so there's some states that might do that. There are, there, but the general principle is, to me, I, I, competitive, competitiveness to me is a side effect, is the idea of I have to respond as a candidate. Uh, so if you ask me for my opinion, I would say that a 50-50 district, as much as I can get it, is the better situation because it allows me the opportunity to uh, have a fair shot that my vote will actually mean something. Uh, so my vote has more weight. Uh, but if you look at that in the aggregate, the more 50-50 districts you make, the more 95 to five districts you're gonna make. So if you look in Pennsylvania, there are some 50-50 districts, but Pennsylvania also has some 95-5 districts in, Pen in uh, Philadelphia. So if you watch the election returns in November, you saw Philadelphia was like enormously pro-Biden uh, to a level of like it's unheard of. Uh, but you go out into central Pennsylvania and up in northern Pennsylvania, you see the exact opposite in favor of Trump. So you see a lot of that in counties that are very rural or very urban. Uh, but realistically, when you have these larger sorts of swath of area, you can kind of combine that a little bit. So it's it's a mixed bag, to be honest, uh, whether or not you competitiveness should be valued or not. But more often than not, competitiveness leads to, I would guess, better policies. And I think a lot of political research would suggest that. So 
So uh, we have another question here from Andy. You mentioned earnings, uh, white, black population, advanced degrees as means of identifying communities. Um, what other criteria or how many other criteria do you use in your models to define communities? So we were just using that as an argument to say, hey, similar people look, live near each other. Uh, so our models don't exactly go into uh, defining communities at that point. Uh, so what I would espouse, though, is if a state were going to use this method, what I would say is you need to define your communities first and then modify the adjacency file that goes into the algorithm to prioritize keeping the group together. Does that make sense? So rather than saying, oh, I'm going to algorithmically define it, I'm going to take local knowledge and say, hey, this group of people is a community. We're going to keep them together. Now let's let the map run based on that assertion. So it's much more crowdsourced in a way is what I would say. So uh, someone asks, Matt, how, so how do the main districts hold up under your analysis? That That's a good question. So what's interesting is Maine has a Maine's philosophy is you have to keep the counties in in tow. Uh, so so long as you can keep a county together, you need to do it. Uh, so when you run Maine through these algorithms, uh, where it tends to want to divide Maine is in Androscoggin County. Uh, it wants to take the two or three towns in the top of the county, so like Turner and that area, and uh, put them in District Two and then uh, take Oxford County, York, Cumberland, Sagadahawk, and throw that in with the rest of Androscoggin, and that's District 1. Uh, as th those of you may know, uh, Maine's districts don't look like that. Maine's districts are York, Cumberland, Androscoggin. No, Androscoggin's in District 2. Uh, so York, Cumberland, Sagadahawk, uh, uh, Lincoln, Knox, uh, and uh, I think that's it, are all one district. So essentially hug the coast and then everything else. But Kennebec is the one that's split. So places like Waterville, places like Augusta, those places are part of District 1, which is interesting because uh, they are the Democratic hotbeds of Kennebec County. And the conservative spots of Kennebec County go to District 2. And I've talked to people who've actually been involved in this uh, they made that decision intentionally to try to make the state go one and one because the state is a relatively purple state. So there's sort of this idea of competitiveness right there for you is this idea of making district two to making choices about the county that gets split in district one to be able to modify district two to be more competitive. So. Really, really interesting stuff. Um, Judy, do you see any other questions to ask or have any comments? Uh, well, uh, so uh, John is thinking about um, how a lot of what we talk about revolves around a two party system. And how oh, yeah. much does that have on the redistricting versus thinking about it, you know, without parties or considering possibly more than two parties? Oh yeah, that that's that's the killer right there. So when you I don't I don't mean to say it that way, but like that that's the crux of the matter. So when you look at it in a competitive environment with a two-party system, you have competing interests. If you're looking at a uh, multi-party system, or you're looking at uh, something where party is irrelevant, uh, that leads to some interesting situations. So the question is. Who wins a vote when you have so Maine now has the ranked choice voting system, which would be really interesting now to see how that would play out in redistricting. Because what's really uh, fascinating about this is we don't know a lot about District 1 in ranked choice voting because it's never had to be applied. So what's that's really interesting to think about the impacts of a third party in that. Uh, so Honestly, it, so the first impact, number one, is that you can't use a 50% barometer to say that a, a group wins a state. You would have to say, hey, wait a minute. If I have a plurality, I'm going to likely take this. But we know that's not necessarily the case either. Uh, 
Uh, so when uh, Golden and Poliquin were running against each other, we saw that that didn't work out in District 2, that just because uh, just because one party had the plurality in the uh, in the actual first round of the vote didn't mean that ranked choice voting didn't turn that into the other party uh, winning it. So mm -hmm. it's interesting to think about the impact of that. Um, and if we had stronger part, uh, stronger, third, I don't like the phrase third party. If we had stronger political parties beyond Democrat and Republican. Uh, you might have a very interesting situation that would occur. And I don't, and particularly in a two district state, that would be really fascinating. But in a state like a California, which has many districts, it's a lot, they, they'd have to be consolidated to get a district. So it would be really, it'd be really fascinating. I, I would not espouse that either the Electoral College or the representative democracy is necessarily the right system. Uh, that's not my place to say that, however. I just look at the system that is. So. Well, I mean, I think uh, uh, at least you're shining a light, uh, you know, and, and fortunately for us, a geospatial light on a, on a really important issue in this country right now. And I like that thinking about, you know, competitiveness, moderate, you know, moderates the middle where, you know, that's really important for this country. And uh, this is a great topic uh, that you've shared with us. And I, I think if we were all sitting in a room, <laughs> Over our lunch, we would be hanging out for a lot longer talking about oh, this. Oh, I'm night. sure. So, yeah, so I really appreciate you stepping up. Um, and I know we still have probably a couple dozen folks that are still on. And so I would just turn to you. Listen, you may not have uh, a topic on on uh, politics, but that's it doesn't matter. We want to talk to you, Spatial. We want to hear what you're working on. And I'm sure that we'll find it interesting. So I hope that some of you folks there that I can you know, can see, I know you're all very smart and you could give us a great talk. So please send us ideas. We would like to, to hear from you. Um, and, just, again, and just to reiterate something I said at the beginning, Patrick, uh, mm -hmm. I am not, uh, so I am actually, I think it's good for people to hear this. I'm relatively apolitical, which is interesting that I'd be doing this at all. So well, I am, I'm much more of a centrist than most people. Um, well, if we, had, if we, I, well, I could see why that would motivate you to want to do this research. To be honest with you, though, on the on the uh, opposite side of yeah, that, yeah, I don't care how it plays out. Like the, pro, I mentioned Jesse, uh, one of our collaborators, to the point of when we were working on this, he would always call me a raging conservative because he's very liberal, uh, <laughs> but I'm not at all. I'm incredibly centrist, and I got into politics. I got into this by accident because a student was interested in it and I had the skills to deal with it. So yeah. there we were. Well, excellent. Well, thanks so much for your time today and thank you everybody who joined us. Um, and uh, we look forward to, uh, to hosting the next one in March uh, and, uh, and to continue on with our series. So again, thank you, Matt. Thank you, Judy. Um, everybody enjoy the, the rest of your day and we'll talk with you all soon.